The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. <clears throat> okay, let's get started. Uh, one announcement, and that is the reminder about the upcoming celebration, Wednesday. There's the coverage. It's up here on the screen. Starts midpoint, lecture 17, starting with Bragg's Law, and goes through the end of uh, November 8th, lecture 24, Diffusion. That'll be the coverage. So let's get on with uh, today's lesson. Uh, it's a continuation of what we began talking about uh, on Wednesday. We started looking at solution chemistry, and we recognized that bonding was the key to understanding why things mix, why things don't mix. And uh, along the way, we came up with some metrics, including the uh, solubility product, uh, which was superior to simply saturation solubility because it allowed us to look at what happens when there is a plurality of solutes. And we came to know the common ion effect, which in the presence of uh, common ion, we observe repressed solubility. Today I want to talk about a subset, some specialized solution chemistry, and that takes us to acids and bases. Acids and bases are pervasive. Uh, perhaps you got up this morning and you washed your hair with pH balanced shampoo and you treated yourself to some orange juice with uh, citric and ascorbic acid. Uh, maybe you had the radio playing, you powered by zinc alkaline batteries. Uh, I started my car thanks to a lead acid battery and I uh, had some appliances running. Electricity generated coal-fired plant which was spewing sulfur dioxide generating acid rain. So, you know, we're off to a good start. Acids and bases are everywhere. So, um, what I wanted to do today was to uh, go a little bit deeper into acids and bases and uh, Unlike last day, today we'll have some history. We're going to go back in time, go back in time, and we're going to go way, way back because acids and bases have been known into antiquity. In fact, uh, humans have used acids in materials processing and in the processing of food. The whole no notion of pickling involves denaturing of protein by a shift in uh, acidity. So acid comes from the Latin word. Acid derives from the Latin word acidus. And acidus means uh, sour or tart. Sour or tart. And that indeed is the, the taste of acid to us. Um, and then modern chemistry, we go to just the uh, pre-dawn of the French Revolution to France and Lavoisier. And it was Lavoisier in 1779, and you know, you know how I would, I'm going to be talking about a number of people from different countries, and a lot of them are from Europe. So what I thought I'd do is to keep everybody straight. I'd use, you know, the oval sticker you see on the back of a car. So Lavoisier, he'd have an F from France. He'd be driving a Peugeot or a Renault, undoubtedly. And uh, Lavoisier tried to understand uh, acids and bases, and he reasoned that oxygen was the key. That oxygen is present in acids. Now we know this to be wrong now, but uh, he spent much of his career studying combustion. In fact, there was a, an intense rivalry between Lavoisier in France, uh, Joseph Priestley in Great Britain, and Scheele in Sweden to try to understand combustion. What was it about air that sustains combustion? And they eventually figured out that it was a constituent of air, which they named oxygen, and uh, it's named oxy as uh, another, uh, it, this comes from the Greek, which means a sharp, as in tart. So oddly enough, and of course, the G-E-N particle you understand as, as meaning uh, to be born, or as we say, to generate, and so on. So oddly enough, the name oxygen is a complete irony, because it's it's named by someone who thought it was a constituent of all acids, and it isn't, but the name remains. 
So that's the way things were in 1779, and then Lavoisier subsequently perished in the French Revolution. Um, and then we go to Britain and Sir Humphrey Davy, and Sir Humphrey Davy in 1810, and uh, he would have a GB driving oh, probably a Jaguar, or maybe an Aston Martin, and he reasoned that it's hydrogen. Hydrogen is present in all acids. Hydrogen is present in all acids. And that was good. That was a good uh, insight. And that's where it stayed. He didn't uh, talk about anything beyond that. He didn't say what's the form of hydrogen. Simply said that it was present in all acids. Then the next milestone comes in uh, 1887. None other than Arrhenius. Arrhenius in 1887. And he was in Sweden. So he has a, an S and he's probably driving a Volvo. And uh, so what he did is he said not only is acid present in, uh, excuse me, is hydrogen present in all acids, but the acid dissociates in water in order to uh, donate protons. So acid is a substance that dissociates in water, dissociates in water, and uh, giving the proton, H+. Plus. And uh, he further talked about the complement of the acid, which he called the base. And he defined the base as the substance that dissociates in water, dissociates in water to give the hydroxyl, OH minus, the hydroxyl. So we have hydroxyl, ion, and proton. So this is what... Uh, this is what Arrhenius told us, and this was all part and parcel of his major contribution that won him the Nobel Prize, which was the theory of electrolytic dissociation. And uh, this was really important because it uh, set the stage for electrochemical processing. Electrochemical processing. So uh, what he reasoned is that when you inject charged species into water, you do the same as we do when we dope semiconductor and we raise the conductivity and uh, we saw the evidence for that last day. So let's look at two examples. This is HCl as a gas, hydrogen chloride as a gas. This is a, a polar molecule. You've done the analysis of this many times. If we bubble this through water, it will dissolve and according to Arrhenius, dissociate to give us the proton, which is now dissolved in water, denoted AQ for aqueous, and chloride ion. So we can see injection of charges, pluses and minuses, and sodium hydroxide as a prototypical example of a base. It's a solid at room temperature, and if it dissolves in water, it gives us sodium ion plus hydroxyl. And furthermore, Arrhenius said that there's a, an overarching reaction that involves reconstitution of the solvent. Water, in this case, is acting as the solvent. Water is acting as the solvent. So we can run the reaction vertically now. We can take HCl aqueous plus NaOH aqueous to give us NaCl aqueous plus H2O. So what we're doing is we're reacting the acid with the base to get the solvent back, water, plus salt. And this is the neutralization reaction. Neutralization reaction. That is to take us away from either acidic or a basic solution. Neutralization involves recombination. Recombination of the solvent. Now, everything I want to talk about today is in reference to aqueous solution chemistry, acids and bases, but these definitions of proton donor and so on apply to non-aqueous solvents. But uh, for 3091, we're going to say we're going to stay in the aqueous phase. Now, what are the shortcomings of Arrhenius' theory? It was good for the late 1880s, but uh, shortcomings always manifest themselves through data. And people had known for quite some time that they could dissolve ammonia, another molecule that we've seen in 3091. They could dissolve ammonia in water, and when they dissolved in 
ammonia and water, they found that they could neutralize, they got an aqueous solution that neutralizes acid. They found that they got an aqueous solution that neutralizes acid. So then they concluded that ammonia dissolved in water is acting as though it's a base. But there's no hydroxyl here. There's no oxygen. So you can't make OH minus here. So something was incomplete. How to explain? How to explain in the absence of, in the absence of OH minus? Well, we had to wait until the 20th century. And the explanation came from two places simultaneously. Bronsted, 1923, in Denmark. He's in Denmark. I suppose he's driving a Volvo II. And Lowry in the UK. Bronsted and Lowry, both independently in the same year, enunciated uh, an enhanced definition, a broader definition of acid and base which is as follows, that acid, acid remains the same as Arrhenius, same as Arrhenius. It's a substance that's a proton, proton donor. So that's same as Arrhenius. But then, to capture the notion that an aqueous solution of ammonia can act as a, as a base, they define the base in terms of something that is chemistry free and they said this is something that is a proton acceptor a proton acceptor now that's different no mention of no mention of hydroxyl anything that accepts proton would fall under the definition of bronsted lowry uh, base so here's the prototypical reaction any substance that has a proton so i'm going to write proton plus everything else so A represents the rest of the chemistry of the compound, where H is a hydrogen that can be uh, dissolved in water and liberated. So this is a proton donor. And for the rest of the lecture, instead of writing H plus, I'm going to write little p plus to indicate proton. So HA is a proton donor, and it reacts with some uh, Bronsted-Lowry base, which is a proton acceptor. It's a proton acceptor. And when it reacts, it B accepts the proton and becomes BH plus, and HA has lost the proton, and it is now simply A minus. Well, if you walked in the room, or, or if you, I, I know this never happens, but if, if you had momentarily dozed off and hadn't caught the last thing that I'd said, you might look at the right-hand side of the equation and say, well, BH plus has a proton that it can give away and become naked B. So this BH plus also is a proton donor. And A minus, we know from looking at the left side of the equation, is perfectly capable of bonding to H. So this A minus must be also a proton acceptor. So now what do we see? We see that the equation comes in conjunction. That B and BH plus are donor and acceptor, and they're associated with one another. So I'm going to denote that, that B and BH plus are associated with one another, and HA and A minus are associated with one another. And we call such pairs, we call such pairs conjugate pairs. These are conjugate pairs. Con is the Latin for with, and uh, Eugera is the Latin for um, to marry. It also is the same word for yoke. Now, I think if you pronounce the J as a Y, you can see how you get yoke in modern English. And in fact, I will designate these with yokes to show that they are conjugate acid-base pairs. And just to be clear about uh, definitions, let's look. Um, HA, this is a proton donor, so this is both a Bronsted-Lowry acid and it's also an Arrhenius acid. It conforms to the old definition of Arrhenius. All right? Um, now, this is a proton acceptor, B, so therefore it's a Bronsted-Lowry base, but it's not an Arrhenius base because it has no hydroxyl. So you can see this is a case of, in some cases, there's a, an overlap, and in others, there isn't. So these are both Bronsted-Lowry 
This is Bronsted-Lowry acid. Now, this would be an Arrhenius acid because it has a proton. It can give away a proton. So this is both a Bronsted-Lowry acid and an Arrhenius acid. And this one here, of course, is simply a Bronsted-Lowry base. It's not a, an Arrhenius base because it has no proton. So you can see there's, uh, there's a nice contrast between the two. So that means in the light of Bronsted and Lowry, we can view now, we view acid-base acid reactions are in fact proton transfer reactions. Proton transfer reactions. Follow the proton. That's the message here. Follow the proton. In fact, the proton is the bearer of acidity. So it's the, you know, follow the bouncing ball, follow the bouncing proton, which is the bearer of acidity. Where the proton goes, that's where the acid is. So now let's go back to ammonia and see if we've solved the problem. So now I'll write the ammonia reaction. NH3, which is now dissolved in water, it's now aqueous, plus water, H2O. What, can, what uh, ammonia can do is it, it neutralizes water uh, what, it, what it does is it neutralizes water not by donating, not by donating hydroxyls, but by drawing up, taking out of circulation protons. See, because acid and base is really a, a ratio. Acid has an excess of protons. So if I want to get rid of the acid, I can either flood it with base or somehow get a vacuum in there and draw up all the protons. So that's what ammonia is doing. And leaving behind what? Leaving behind hydroxyl. So it's generating hydroxyl indirectly. In and so let's, let's call these what they are. So this is a proton acceptor. This is a proton acceptor. And here's its conjugate acid. So this is obviously a, a proton donor. And w if we come up with a new improved theory and we do not declare hydroxyl a base, we failed. We better make sure that's the case. And this indeed is a proton acceptor. And leaving water, water is acting as a proton donor. So pure water acting opposite ammonia is acting as an acid here, acting as an acid. So this is Bronsted-Lowry base. So we've solved the problem, the thorny problem of the observation that ammonia has the capacity to neutralize some solutions. And this uh, water is acting as a Bronsted-Lowry acid. And then you see the conjugate acid and base pairs as follows. Here's water and hydroxyl are conjugates, and ammonia, and this ion here, which is called ammonium. Ammonium. And ammonium is one of the few polyatomic ions that's positive. Most of the polyatomic ions, things like carbonate, sulfate, phosphate, are negative. But this is one of the few that's positive. So I think we should have special respect for, uh, for ammonium, for, for its rarity. It's a rara avis. It's a rare bird. So now let's go into the chemistry. How do we identify substances that are going to act as Bronsted-Lowry bases? Whenever I ask you how, that's your queen of diamonds, what do you do? You go, he said, how? I go, electronic structure. Let's look at electronic structure. So I'm going to look at electronic structure of ammonia and of proton, because ammonia is a proton uh, acceptor. So let's look at it. Here's proton. Actually, I said I was going to uh, write it only as, as uh, P plus, but I'm going to do it this one last time. What's the, uh, what's the Lewis structure of this? Where are the electrons? There are none. There are none. This brings nothing. You know, this is proton, and proton, proton contributes nothing, you know, when it enters into bonds. It's like a needy friend, you know. It just, it just takes. It doesn't give. You know, it takes your time, drains your emotional energy. That's proton. You, you, we all have protons in our lives, I'm sure, okay? And I'm not just talking about the orange juice. Now, let's look at ammonia. Ammonia is... NH3, nitrogen has five valence electrons, three of them are shared with the three hydrogens, and there are two valence electrons sitting up here in their own orbital. And in the past, we were circling these in blue and calling them non-bonding 
electrons, non-bonding electrons. This is a non-bonding pair. Well, guess what happens? You have a situation where the proton has no electrons and it wants to glom onto something that will be the base because it's a proton acceptor. The only thing that can accept protons must come up with both electrons. So it's axiomatic. The only substances that could possibly act as Bronsted-Lowry bases must be substances endowed with lone pairs or non-bonding electrons. So, so to find, to find Bronsted-Lowry bases, look for non-bonding pairs. Look for non-bonding pairs. All you need is one. All you need is one. So let's look at some other substances that could do this. Uh, how about water? What about water? Well, we can do the Lewis structure of water, HOH. So oxygen has six uh, valence electrons. Two are in the orbital sharing with hydrogen, leaving us with two, not one, but two non-bonding pairs. So we know that this tells us that water could possibly act as a, uh, as a Bronsted-Lowry base. And the conjugate acid, what's the conjugate acid? If this is not Bronsted-Lowry base, it uh, allows a proton to attach here. So that means we're going to have three hydrogens here, and the conjugate base is shown as follows. It's going to be this one, H, 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 and then the last non-bonding pair. And this has the chemical formula of H3O plus and has the name hydronium, hydronium. So hydronium is the conjugate acid to water, which is acting as a Bronsted-Lowry base. And we can write the reaction and show that water, water is very versatile. So I'm going to take water and react it with water. Water plus water, if I wanted to just waste your time, I'd write 2H2O on the right-hand side and leave the auditorium. But I decided I want to keep my job, and so what I'm going to do instead is write H3O plus to give you the conjugate acid, leaving behind OH minus as the conjugate base. Okay? So let's write. We have this is acid here, and this, this is base. And I mean, I'm looking at the two waters. I'm just designating them arbitrarily. Uh, so let's make this acid. And of course, hydroxyl must be a base. And then we can group them in conjugate pairs. So H2O is a conjugate to hydronium, and H2O is a conjugate to hydroxyl. So we have the two conjugate pairs here. And we say that such substances that can be both proton donors and proton acceptors have this uh, dual nature associated with them, and we call these amphi, amphiprotic, amphiprotic. They behave in, in two ways with respect to proton. It's sort of like amphitheater. You know what amphitheater? You know the Roman theater? If you're looking top down, a Roman theater looks like this. And here's the stage, and here's all the terraces, and, and the screaming people, and everything else. But what you can do is you can take two theaters, two theaters, and you put them together, and now you have theater in the round. That's an amphitheater, all right? So this is amphiprotic, because now you can look at the stage from both sides and scream. So. Now, it turns out that both um, hydronium and uh, hydroxyl are very strong. They have a very high chemical potential. So that means it doesn't take much of them to express themselves. Both have, both have high chemical potential. And this chemical potential is analogous to gravitational potential. The higher the chemical potential, the greater the chemical uh, reactivity, the greater the, the chemical power. So they have a very high chemical potential. It's certainly much greater than that of pure water. Pure water is, is relatively stable and calm. And so it takes very little for them to uh, express themselves. And it turns out that the extent of that reaction that I've written, the extent of that reaction is really very minimal. And at 25 degrees C, you expect that reaction to give uh, about, one part in, uh, about one part in 10 million, the degree of dissociation of water is about 10 to the minus 7. And obviously, from the stoichiometry, whenever water dissociates, you get equal numbers of hydronium and hydroxyl. And this reaction in which water 
decomposes, dissociates, is called the self-dissociation, self-dissociation reaction, or some people also refer to it as uh, self-ionization, self-ionization. We start with neutral water, it dissociates, and we get the uh, hydronium and, uh, and the hydroxyl. And we know that pure water is a very poor conductor. In fact, it's an insulator. We saw that last day. And this is proof of it, that even though we have carriers here, these are both charge carriers, we have so few of them that it doesn't do much to uh, uh, give us electrical conductivity. So analogous to a uh, solubility product, we can write a, a constant called KW, which is analogous to a solubility product, and it's the water dissociation product, and it's simply the product of the concentration of hydronium ion and the concentration of hydroxyl ion. And why are we doing this? Because we saw last day that if we express solubility by a single number, that would only work in one solute solutions. If we use the solubility product, we could answer questions, what happens when there's a second solute coming in with a common ion? Same thing here. If all you have is pure water, I could just tell you that the dissociation constant is 10 to the minus 7. End of story. But if I use this product and then throw in a second source of acid, this product will remain the same, but the hydroxyl will move up and down. So this is the setting the stage for acid-base equilibria. And before I draw the double line, let me point out that this is a vanishingly small number. It's the square of 10 to the minus 7. It's 10 to the minus 14 at room temperature. So these are pitifully small numbers. So we can see that if we add another source of acid, then the proton level will go down, and we end up with something that is uh, acidic or vice versa. So we can then define an acidic solution. An acidic solution is one that's out of equilibrium with this. This is a neutral solution. I started with pure water. It's self-dissociated. So an acidic solution has another source of proton. And in that case, the concentration of hydronium ion exceeds the concentration of hydroxyl ion because of another source. This is not from self-dissociation, OK? Not self dissociation, not self-ionization. We've got some other source. And the alternative is the basic solution, the basic solution. And in that case, the concentration of hydronium is less than the concentration of hydroxyl. Again, not in self-dissociation. We have to have some other uh, donor here. So the acidic solution is proton rich whereas the uh, basic solution is proton deficient. deficient. So how do we maintain charge neutrality? Well, we can put in, some other, put in some other negative. We can put in some anion. We can maintain charge neutrality in other ways. All right. Oh, by the way, sometimes we call this alkaline solutions. Basic, we don't call it the zinc basic battery. We call it the zinc alkaline battery. And that comes from Arabic alkali, which goes back to about the 10th century where there was a recognition that if you took the uh, certain plants, you took the calcined ashes of certain plants and dissolved them in water, they made this uh, uh, tart solution that we know now today to be uh, uh, the same as uh, an alkaline solution, giving us the higher. So we can also call it alkaline. So that's the same thing. So now what we can do, now what we can do is uh, look at how this varies. And let's see, draw your attention to the trace here. So this is simply the plot of this equilibrium. All I'm doing is plotting the KW at 25 degrees C. And what you see is that exactly when we have a neutral solution, the concentration of proton equals the concentration of hydroxyl. They're both at 10 to the minus 7. If we end up with something that has an excess of proton, then necessarily, if the product is constant, if proton number goes up, hydroxyl number goes down, and vice versa. So this is how the, this uh, system operates. And I don't like this one because it's really it's, it's nonlinear. And you know, I really don't like nonlinearity because we basically have this. I can't do anything. Eyeball it. It's x, y equals constant. It's a rectangular hyperbola. And no good. 
No good. What I'd like to do is I'd like to use some kind of transformation and convert this into a straight line. So I'd like to have some kind of f of x and a g of y. And in doing so, I'd end up with something that's a straight line. And that offers me two advantages. First of all, I can took, take a look at some data set and look at, with the naked eye, goodness of fit to see if my system is behaving, if my data are good. And the second thing is, if I understand how to construct the transformation, this may give me clues as to the underlying science. So that's why we try to get away from these nonlinear representations and do something that is uh, uh, linear. And for that, uh, we go to Denmark, 1909, a, uh, a young biochemist by the name of Sorensen. Sorensen, in 1909, in keeping with our tradition today, he gets the Denmark sticker. He was a biochemist working at the Carlsberg Brewery in Copenhagen. Carlsberg Brewery had a research biochemist working. Why? When you're brewing beer, you want to control the acidity of the mash in order to make sure that your uh, brewing is on chemical target. And what he did, being a, a good, uh, a good uh, chemist, he looked at the situation and said, I don't like this nonlinearity. And so what he did is he said, I'm going to, if you'll pardon the pun, straighten things out. And so what he did is he said, I'm going to define, I'm going to define a quantity that it will represent the chemical potential of hydrogen. Chemical potential of, let's say, hydronium. The chemical potential of hydronium. So he used this uh, symbol lowercase p and the capital the uppercase H for the chemical potential of hydronium, and he defined this in a logarithmic fashion. So it's log base 10 of the hydronium concentration. And furthermore, uh, being practical, he recognized that these are always numbers less than one. So the log of a number less than one is a negative number, and who wants to drag negative numbers around? So he defined it with a minus sign in front of it, so that a 10 to the minus 7 becomes a pH plus 7. 10 to the minus 7 concentration becomes a pH plus 7. And he furthermore defined a chemical potential of hydronium ion, pOH, as minus log base 10 of the concentration of hydroxyl. So there we go. And now if you take this and uh, put, this to, uh, put this to the plot, you'll see the following. You end up now with a straight line, so we've accomplished our mission of getting something that allows us easily to determine goodness of fit. And the second thing is, look at the range. We move here from 10 to the 14 down to 1, whereas on this plot, we started at 10 to the minus 7, and we move barely a decade. So by linearizing on a log-log plot, we have a much, much greater range of chemistry to express. And so now we talk about acid. Acid is something that has low pH because the pH is defined as minus the log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So proton rich is low pH, and the base is something that is high pH, according to this definition. And now we have, instead of that xy equals constant, we have x plus y equals constant, and this is now very, very nice to master, where this is the pH and the ordinate is pOH. So let's look at uh, some values, put some values on it. Here are some common substances. We've got here water in the center, uh, milk, blood. These are all very nearly neutral, mildly acidic, mildly uh, alkaline. If you drank coffee this morning, you, you drank something that was uh, more acidic, tomatoes more acidic. Wine, you've, uh, I know you don't know anything about this, but you probably have read in the newspapers or in magazines people describing wines as being mildly acidic or so on. And indeed, the, the pH is down here. If the wine spoils, it becomes sour wine, van agra. Agra it means eager, but the medieval meaning of eager was something that was uh, rather fresh, rather impetuous, tart. So this is vinegar. Colas are down here thanks to uh, benzoic and phosphoric acid. Lemon juice is here. You're, so if you drink a lot of uh, Coke or Pepsi, 
you're coming in about pH 3, but your stomach is down around pH 1 and a half. But some of us just can't take uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, acidic uh, media because uh, they just drive our pH even lower because we keep contributing more and more protons. And if our stomach wall isn't up to it, it'll get ulcerated. So what do we do? We shift the pH back. And how do we shift the pH back? We introduce something that is a proton acceptor, a vacuum cleaner for the protons. And so the classical uh, formula is something uh, in the liquid form. It's the suspension, milk of magnesia, uh, or in this tablet form, these things like Rolaids and Tums and so on. All they're doing is contributing proton acceptors and driving the, the pH in a, in a positive direction. I suppose if you were really aggressive, you could try household ammonia, but I would counsel against it. Be patient. Be patient. Counsel against doing that. Now this gives you some sense of scale. Okay, so now we know what we have. But now, you know, so far we've been assuming if I introduce an acid, it dissociates and I get protons. All acids are not created equal. Some are strong and some are weak. And what do we mean by that? Well, let's first of all look at the strong acid. If I have a solution of one molar, HCl, that's hydrochloric acid, what I get, I can assume that this dissociates fully, dissociates fully to give me one molar hydronium. The concentration of hydronium is exactly, I get total dissociation, total dissociation. But that's not always the case, so we can look at something that's a little bit weaker, and I'm going to look at acetic acid, acetic acid. And this is the constituent of, of vinegar, so its formula is given as follows, CH3COOH. So this, this frontal part is acetate, this is acetate, and then plus proton. And when we dissolve this in water, when we dissolve this in water, we end up with, uh, let me do this a little bit differently. When we dissolve this in water, I want to break this into two steps. First of all, we have this, if you like, acetate, hydrogen acetate, and then what we'll do is we'll dissolve it in water to get CH3, COOH, and I'm just going to write AQ. All I've done is I've dissolved the compound in water. And now what I want to do is now I want to look at its dissociation, its extent of dissociation. So for that we go, so this, let's just call this dissolution. All things that dissolve don't necessarily dissociate fully. So let's look at its now uh, dissociation reaction, and for that we write CH3, COOH, which is now in solution, plus water. And what it's, water is going to contribute in the following. We have H3O plus makes the hydronium ion and then leaves behind the acetate ion. So Now, compare. In one molar HCl, we have one molar uh, hydronium. In one molar acetic acid, we have only about a half a percent. 0.4 percent reacts to give H3O plus and the acetate ion. So if we write then an acid dissociation constant, it's going to be the product of hydronium and acetate over water, we'll end up with hydronium times acetate divided by the undissociated acid. And in this case, the number is 10 to the minus 5. There's very little dissociation. 10 to the minus 5, that's down around 10 to the minus 7, which was self-ionization of water. So this is a very weak acid. This is very weak, very weak, poor proton donor. It's a poor proton donor. So what am I showing? I'm showing that it dissolves, but it doesn't dissociate. So what we need in order to have full acidity is to have not only the substance dissolved, but it has to dissociate to give us protons. So this we call a weak acid, and we see we have a very low value of the Ka, which is termed the acid dissociation constant. 
acid dissociation constant. And it's analogous to the solubility product that we met last day. Uh, acid dissociation constant for HCl, just for, just for reference, Ka for HCl is equal to the proton concentration times the chloride ion concentration over the dissolved but undissociated HCl. There's almost none of this. All the HCl virtually dissociates, and this number is 10 to the plus 6. So there's a ratio of 10 to the 11th. Look at this. This is 10 to the minus 5. This is 10 to the plus 6. This is a ratio of 10 to the 11th. And 6 molar, and 6 molar HCl, we have 99.96% dissociation conversion to H3O+. Plus. So we call this a very, very strong acid, and this is a weak acid. So strong acids and strong acids, Ka is greater than 1, and in weak acids, Ka is less than 1. And then you have these moderate acids right around the middle, and I've got some charts here to illustrate this. So th this is a very primitive uh, uh, graphic to show that in, in the case of a strong acid, you get 100% dissociation. So all of the H becomes H3O+. Plus. In a weak acid, you only get partial dissociation. So you still have a lot of this undissociated neutral stuff, which isn't active. There's no proton. There's no acidity. And then a very weak acid essentially doesn't dissociate. It goes in a solution, and you have a molecular liquid. There's no protons. And so no protons this is a poor conductor of electricity. So conductivity will allow you to track the amount of dissociation. This is taken from your reading. This is table 11.3. And you can see the uh, acid dissociation constants. There's HCl at 10 to the plus 6, HBr, HI. Um, there's HF. Hydrofluoric acid is actually a mildly weak acid. And then down here you have citric and, and so on. There's carbonic, which is the seltzer and so on. And, uh, oh, we can jump over that. We don't need that. This is an interesting one. Why hydroiodic acid is even stronger than hydrochloric acid? Because you have here a stronger bond strength. Fluorine is smaller. It pulls uh, proton in tighter. And so the degree of dissociation isn't as great as it is here. So these, these end up scaling as the uh, acid dissociation constants. So in general, equal acid strength doesn't mean equal uh, concentration. So now let's go to the last definition. The last definition, also 1923, but we're going stateside now. We're going to the United States. Yeah. 1923, G.N. Lewis. G.N. Lewis, the same person that gave us the Lewis uh, structure notation. 1923, so we'll put USA on the back of his undoubtedly Chevrolet, and he gave a definition that goes way beyond, way beyond Bronsted and Lowry, and, and is free of all constraints of composition. And he said, look, if you recognize that what you're looking for is something with a non-bonding pair, then let's talk about a base as something that has the non-bonding pair. That is to say, in the past we said it was a proton acceptor. Well, why don't we look at the non-bonding pair. Remember how I gave you that analogy with the traffic? Don't look at the car, look at the car vacancy. Well, instead, don't look at the proton, look at the bonding electron, the non-bonding electrons. So, what we had before is we said that the that the Bronsted-Lowry base, the Bronsted-Lowry base had a non-bonding pair. So what Lewis says don't talk about this as a proton acceptor. Let's talk about this as an electron pair donor. So he's following the vacancy instead of the car. So anything that's an electron pair donor, he's going to call a base. And then he's going to call, what's the mate to this? It doesn't have to be a proton. It could be anything that's capable of accepting electrons. So I'm going to call that a hollow orbital. So my acid is anything that is an electron pair acceptor. And now look at this. This is the highest conceptualization. My neutralization reaction. Acid plus base gives solvent. Electron pair non-bonding. Empty orbital. What happens if I take an electron pair non-bonding and mate it with an empty orbital? What do I form? 
a bond. This is very, very high level. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's not restricted to solutions, aqueous solutions. This is Darwin. He's rising out of the water. He can talk about gas reactions, about solid state reactions. This is free of all constraints. This is electron pair plus empty orbital gives bond. All, all date of chemistry, all date of bonds. All date of bonds are captured here. This is huge. This is huge. So let's take a look at an example where that would come into play, and we'll wrap into some environmental stuff as well. Um, I mentioned earlier about burning coal. In the United States, about 50% of our electrical energy is generated in coal-fired power plants. 17% uh, natural gas, 3% 3, 3 petroleum. There's very little that's non-carbon right now. And industrial coal contains sulfur at the ratio of about 1%. It's an impurity in uh, coal. And one ton of coal will burn to give you about 25 million British thermal units, or 2.6 times 10 to the 10th joules of energy. And here's a nice figure to remember. It's three tons of coal gives you one megawatt day. A megawatt is a power unit. You take power times time, you have energy. So if you burn one mega, excuse me, if you generate one megawatt for 24 hours, that's, a, that's an energy unit. You need three tons of coal. And just for comparison, you need one gram of uranium. So think, three tons coal, one gram uranium. You make, you make policy, all right? Uh, a 10 megawatt plant burns about 30 tons of coal a day, given that ratio, generating a third of a ton of sulfur, which makes two-thirds of a ton of SO2, because it goes up the stack and burns. So we can reduce sulfur dioxide emissions. Why do we care? Because sulfur dioxide eventually becomes H2SO4. This is a precursor to acid rain. So what we can do is we can trap, we can trap sulfur dioxide on lime, CaO, to form calcium sulfite. And I'm going to do that thanks to G.N. Lewis. So here's the reaction. Here's sulfur dioxide. It's as sulfur with two oxygens, and this is a double bond, a single bond. So this is resonant. Each of these bonds is really about one and a half order. And calcium oxide, as you know, is an ionic oxide. It's calcium cation and oxide anion. And an oxide anion, it's got non-bonding pairs to beat the band, right? How many non-bonding pairs? F four. All right, so now what it can do is it can sidle up next to the SO2 if SO2 is made to pass over a bed of lime. And here's what happens. One of these electron pairs is donated to the sulfur, which then breaks this double bond and forms three bonds. Why does it form three bonds? Because three bonds is stabler than two bonds. Okay? So thanks to this, we have calcium oxide acting as a Lewis base, right? It's actually the O double minus is a Lewis base. According to this definition, base is an electron pair donor. SO2 is a Lewis acid. It better be. If Lewis's definition, you know, you know SO2 leads to H2SO4, that's acidic. If I've got a new definition that tells me that it's basic, I don't like that. So this is consistent. So SO2 is a Lewis acid. It accepts the electron pair. And now we've trapped, instead of having a fugitive, SO2, it's now a solid calcium sulfite. The volume is dramatically reduced, and now we can safely dispose of the calcium sulfite and, and take advantage of what we've learned from G.N. Lewis. And on that happy note, I will say uh, have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday.